Welcome back to another episode of Talking Stocks. My name is Joe. I'm here with Todd Campbell, as always. Todd, how are you doing? Doing okay, Joe. It's been a crazy week in Ooh. the markets. All I'm sorts sure of stuff. Everybody's going to be looking forward to, you know, listening to our show and other shows this weekend, trying to get the, a grasp on what's going on. And hopefully just, we can do our best. Just trying to make sense of it. You know, I was, I was saying before we hit record that it's, it's just stunning to me that stock prices continue to fall overall. When also this week, I heard rumors of 5% GDP growth this year. So you really have two ends of the spectrum. And we'll, we'll get into that uh, for sure a little bit later in the show. But, but first, I just want to kind of get a, a general idea from, from you. Like, how do you, how do you make sense of this little kind of mini sell-off that's happening this week? Like, what is the, what is the reasoning behind it? Well, I mean, I think it might be useful to try to walk people through my process and how I kind of evaluate the market health. Um, you know, it's kind of like taking the blood pressure of, of the market on a regular basis to see where we stand and when you want to be maybe reining in some risk uh, and raising some cash versus deploying it. And by, by measuring kind of market health, that's what allows me to, or I feel like it gives me a little bit of an edge and able to, for example, over the course of the last six, eight weeks, I was raising a little bit of cash, a little bit of cash, a little bit of cash. I ended up with about 20, it's a little over 20% in cash heading into the week. And then I've used this pullback this week to deploy a lot of that. I think I have a couple bullets left in the gun, but I've fired most of my bullets. I'm probably down to about seven or 8% cash now. And, you know, by sort of checking in on the market health and getting a feel for it, you can kind of, I don't know, maybe ride those waves a little bit, take advantage of more opportunities and, you know, get into some names uh, rather than saying chase these things higher. And there are a few different things, Joe, that I, I look at. I mean, one is just sentiment, right? I mean, just, and again, that's market feel. That's, you know, you're on Twitter, you're engaging with people and you're listening to them talk. And, you know, we've certainly seen a ratchet up in people's optimism over the past two months. I mean, people loving very highly speculative stocks, right? The whole thing with the Robin Hood and the GameStop and then morphing into this whole conversation on SPACs and then, you know, just buying a lot of these pre-revenue kind of companies and focusing YOLOing it and, you know, going to the moon. So I mean, there is that kind of a, you know, you can think about that and say to yourself, okay, things maybe are getting a little bit a little bit frothy. And one of the people I like to listen to sometimes on is Art Cashin, who's been on the trading floor for 60 years. You know, I think he was on CNBC today. And he's like, you know, when you get to a point in 60 years, you, you've kind of seen and done everything. And, you know, you, you listen to someone like him and he's like, yeah, when things are getting a little bit speculative like that, you've got to be a little bit cognizant of it. I do like to look at um, the American Association of Individual Investors, AAII, does a sentiment survey, survey that comes out every week. And at inflection points, it can be useful. So I'm just going to share my screen, Joe. And um, for the people who are, you know, listening to the podcast, um, I'm just going to pull up the AII sentiment survey website. And, you know, you can just find this on Google by going AII sentiment survey and then clicking on it. And you can kind of track alongside of it. And you can see in the most current week, we're at 46% bullish and 23.8% bearish. That 23.8% is pretty low. It's, it's among, it's around the same level, lowest levels that we've seen since September. And we're a little bit less bullish than we were last week. On the 17th, we were at 47%. We're down to 46, 45.9 as of the survey date on the 24th. So that was what, Wednesday? Um, you know, and, but you can see it's still above the historical view. You know, you can look at it and say, okay, 38% versus 30%. They're still tilted towards optimism. So that's one thing that I like to look at and you can track along. I also like to look at uh, the put call ratio chart. And you can just type in CBOE equity put call chart. Um, I get it off of wide charts, but you can get it right off of the um, CBOE's website. And, you know, you can't really get behind here unless I log in, but you can see that it's at 0 0.47. And historically, if you go back to like, for example, a bottom in March, we were at 1.2. That means that, you know, one to one, one reading one would mean there's as many puts, so people betting against the market 
uh, individual stocks in the market as there are calls, uh, people betting bullish for the market. So, you know, when you see this get up around 0.7 or higher is usually when you would say to yourself, okay, you know, it's time I can buy. But when you get really low 0.5 or below 0.4, something like that, that would make, uh, that should make you a little bit concerned that we're getting elevated. And then this is the chart that you and I shared on this, on the screen multiple times over the course of the last year. It's become less useful in, on its own because the market has just continued to run. Um, but I still look at it every week just to remind myself, yeah, we are, we're pretty optimistic as a, as a crowd right now in stocks. Currently we have just shy of 80% of the 1600 stocks in our curated universe, um, curated universe that are trading 5% or more above the 200 day moving average. So again, that would, that's something that I'm always checking in on Joe, just to sort of see where we are and kind of get that feel for that market health. Because, you know, the thing to remember as investors is that we can be the best stock pickers on earth, but if the market is in distribution, if the market is going down, the odds of us being right and making money are, are low, low. But if, you, if the market health is strong, if it's good, in good health uh, and it's under accumulation, then it, the, we have that tailwind where it kind of improves our ability to, to make, you know, to go out and buy stocks and actually make money, which is, which is really the, the name of the game. So, we had those, that backdrop, you know, we had these the people on the AI survey, pretty bullish. We had a pretty low put call, uh, equity put call ratio. We had a very high reading on our uh, overbought indicator. That would tend to lead you to want to raise some cash. And then, you know, you look at it then say, okay, well now we're in distribution. I'm seeing a lot of people saying, oh my God, are we done yet? Are we done yet? I've seen multiple people post on Twitter that they were down 14 or 15% in a single day. We saw um, some very highly speculative stocks, like I'm thinking of CCIV, which is the SPAC that's bringing Lucid Motors pop, uh, uh, public. That reported that that deal is indeed going forward, yet the CCIV stock fell almost 50%. So you've got a lot of these really highly speculative stocks have sold off very, very sharply. I've seen some people talking about their account getting blown up because they were on leverage or margin or they were trafficking in the short-term options. When you start to hear a lot of those conversations and the market is selling off like it has over the course of the last week or so, I think the NASDAQ 100 is down about, I think it got down about 7% at the low today. Then to me that says, okay, I can start going out and spending a little bit of money buying some stocks. So I think what we saw today or the, over the course of the last week, Joe, is just that things were too good for too long. I mean, they were just, it's not that easy to throw a dart and make that much money. And at some point, you know, the market's going to take some of that money back. The house is going to win some of that money back. And that's what we've seen over the course of last week. And that's creating some opportunities. So I, there's a lot, you could argue, Joe, why the mark, what was the catalyst? I mean, in hindsight, you can always kind of figure out what a catalyst is for something. I think that you probably had, you saw the long end of bond yields start to climb. I think you got up to about 1.6% yield on the 10-year treasury. That's higher than the S&P 500's dividend yield for the first time in a while. So that might have gotten some people's attention. Um, so there's, you know, and then the whole debate, like you said earlier, I mean, GDP, if your expectation is for GDP to grow 5%, that's pretty big for an established economy, even though we've had such a tough year, right? That's still pretty big. So then you say to yourself, oh, what's the next move for the Fed? And the next move for the Fed would be for it to shift hawkish instead of dovish and for it to raise interest rates. And raising interest rates is typically negative for stocks after they've done a couple raises. So maybe you had some people kind of looking forward and saying, okay, well, if the economy really does accelerate, the Fed could be behind the curve and have to stomp on the brakes. And then maybe that is just the, all the incentive I needed to book some of the profits that I had generated over the course of the last six months. Yeah. So uh, before we shift gears, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, I just want to, I just want to kind of take you a step further on that. So going back to that, that social sentiment for a second, where do you, where do you fall on that, on that spectrum right now? Are you, 
you, it seems like you're, you're still fairly bullish. I mean, you haven't given us really any, any significant cause to, to worry or, you know, be concerned about the, the near future. But yeah, I, I, I want to hear just generally, you know, are you, are you overall pretty bullish or is it bullish on a select type of company or industry? We get a 10% correction about once every 14 months, right? So, I mean, is this really that bizarre that the, that the NASDAQ fell 7%? I mean, the S&P itself is only down, I think it was down only 3%. And that's because we're seeing rotation. So there isn't this, it's not like last February, March, where it was get me out of everything now, right? It's more rotation. You're seeing the tech heavy NASDAQ, it's these speculative names. You're seeing the air come out of those balloons, right? And you're seeing inflows go into areas that are under owned and really not that exciting. Things like banks. And we've talked about energy a lot on the show the last few weeks as being a, a safe haven. I mean, some of the energy stocks this week, huge while the NASDAQ was selling off. So it's been more of a kind of a orderly um, rotation out of some of these really speculative baskets into these less speculative baskets. And to me, that's bullish. That's just natural market taking some of the air out of the balloon. And, and I, I, so I'm not, this, I'm, nothing I've seen so far in the past week has made me concerned. And that's why I felt okay stepping in and buying some stock over the course of the last three trading days. Now, typically, we're recording this on a Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know where we'll close today. We opened green. I hate that. If we've been selling off, I'd rather see an open red reversal day up. Fridays, historically, the market typically doesn't bottom on Wednesdays or Fridays. Some of the inside baseball data <laughs> for those people who love data. Um, much, bet, much more likely you get a bottom on a Monday, a Tuesday, or a Thursday. So we opened green, we sold off, we retested the low on Thursday, which was also the retest of the low, I think, on Tuesday. We bounced off of it. Um, I don't know where we closed today. I, I have some, like I said, I've saved some more bullets for next week. If we roll over again next week, I'll, I'll probably spend that. But no, no, I think that I'm still bullish overall, Joe. I think this is just a normal correction in a bull market. The Fed is still accommodative, right? Rates are still zip. Um, you still have 1.9 trillion stimulus package making its way through. You still have savings rates that are up, not down, uh, because of the last stimulus. Um, so no, I, I, I think overall, if my opinion in the market is that this is just a healthy yet painful correction for many people, um, and, and it's just gonna become increasingly you know, important to focus on sector, industry, and stock. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll get into some of those picks, uh, some of the stocks that you bought this week later in the show. Uh, but for now, plowing ahead, um, I want to talk about, you had kind of hinted at it earlier, these, these speculative pre-revenue was the, the term that, that you used. Uh, companies. So really, we're talking about we're talking about SPACs here. We've never talked about SPACs on the show. There, there's so much that, frankly, we don't know about it. Um, it's, but it's somewhat of a revolution on Wall Street right now. And there are so so many of these that have gone public since the first of the year that we we thought it it at least bore a little bit of discussion time on this show. So uh, I know there was one specific one that you wanted to talk about. So I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you lead into that. Well, I think it's a great week to talk about it because Churchill, CCIV wow. is the symbol, um, you know, long awaited news on whether or not they would be the ones that are bringing Lucid Motors, a potential Tesla competitor public. They finally announced that news and the stock promptly got cut in half. Ouch. You know, and, and I, I got a lot of questions from people in the class that I teach at UNH, uh, how to talk stocks. I got a lot of people reach out to me and say, well, I thought it was just going to go up because when the news came out, this, now it's official. But again, remember, listeners, that, you know, it's buy the rumor, sell the news. When you have everybody expecting an outcome, the market will do the opposite. 
okay? If everybody's tilting to one side of the boat, it's best to start moving to the other side of the boat before everybody else, because it's likely that, you know, you will get a correction, um, in, you know, when that news comes out. So SPACs are really unique, Joe. I mean, I've been 20 plus years of investing and I got to a point where I thought I knew every stock ticker and every company. And now it's like, oh my God, what are all these? Yeah, now there's just an absolute blitz of new companies that you've never heard of and that may have been incorporated yesterday. That's, yeah. that's the crazy thing is that some, some multimillionaire or billionaire can go out there and start a SPAC and basically take it public the next day for God only knows what reason, right? Well, and, and I think that this is, you know, gets kind of the crux of what the heck is a SPAC, Todd? What are yeah. you talking about? So <clears throat> special purpose acquisition company, SPAC. And it's essentially a different way to take a company public. So in the olden days, <laughs> pre-December, <laughs> <laughs> you know, way back when, uh, it, you would do a traditional IPO. You'd have all these filings. You'd do a roadshow. You'd you'd have to get SEC approval for it. Um, it was a long, drawn out, uh, and costly regulatory experience. And then the IPO would launch. You with and who knows what price you'd get, and the retail investors would get whatever the opening tick was, right? Because most likely you're not an accredited investor, and you're not getting exposure to the IPO until it starts trading on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. So that's how a company that was going public would do it. SPACs have existed for a while. I mean, they, they've been around prior to this. Virgin Galactic space, which I happen to belong, that was brought public via a SPAC. A SPAC does it a little bit differently. The company gets formed and gets launched and any money through the IPO of that acquisition company gets put in trust and it can use that and give that to whatever company uh, it ends up bringing public. So it's a, it's a shorter route to market, less regulatory burden. Um, it's just easier in many respects than doing it the old fashioned way. And I think a lot of people have looked at this and said, well, SPACs are awesome. They can be. Um, I think that there are going to be big winners and big losers though. And I think that what's happening is that people are buying every SPAC that launches, assuming that that SPAC is going to bring, bring this amazing company that we've never heard of, that's private, that we've never been able to invest in public. But I, I thought that stonks only go up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, the, you know, and I guess that's why we, again, why we saw the market pull back, because it did get to a point where everybody was buying every SPAC and just assuming that every SPAC was going to just go to the moon, right? Yes, SPACs, I think, do a better job of democratizing access to, uh, to, to new, newly public companies, because theoretically you can buy the SPAC at the SPAC IPO price prior to even knowing what company they're merging with. And that allows you to get in at a very low level if you've done your homework, you feel confident that, but see, it, but there's, there's a disclosure issue too, because you're, you're investing in these SPACs based on the sponsor, right? You're saying, okay, well, I believe in this sponsor and they're connected enough so that anybody who's got a really good private company that wants to go public, they'll want to work with that SPAC sponsor. So some billionaire uh, venture capitalist or whatever, someone who's really connected or whatever. Um, you know, that may or may not be true, right? Um, so, so then you have to say, well, okay, well now a merger has been announced about this company. How good is this company really, right? But it, unlike an IPO where you have the S1, the disclosure documents are much more limited. And because they're much more limited, uh, you're, you're getting a lot of, okay, this is what the SPAC deal is valued at based on EBITDA from five, five years out or 10 years. I saw one that came out recently that was looking at 2030 projections. I'm like, that doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. I mean, Joe, you and I can come up with a 2030 projection. Does that mean I should, you know, someone else should listen to it? Right. Yeah. Of course not. No, no. I mean, you need to be able to look at the actual numbers and do a lot more deep dive due diligence before you invest your own money. And I think that's one of the things that SPACs could really improve on from here is just giving you better access to creating less friction to knowledge, right? So it's, if, it's, it's, if, it, if in one way it's creating less friction to participating in IPOs, great. But you also at the same time have to create less friction to insight. So the, the people who are buying it 
know what they're buying and can make educated decisions on it. You know, Charlie Munger was out this week. Charlie Munger obviously being Warren Buffett's partner. He had some choice words, didn't he? <laughs> I can I can read this if if you want. Yeah, you might uh, want to just insert some beeps, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um I I don't I don't know. We've never really established like what our what our FCC rating is for the show, but we'll keep it PG at least for right now. So essentially uh well, just a little background Mung, uh, Munger said had some pretty choice words to say at this Daily Journal annual meeting. Uh this was on Wednesday. So a couple days ago, we're recording on Friday. Uh, he said, the world would be better off without SPACs. Goes on to say, crazy speculation in enterprises not even found or picked out yet is a sign of an irritating bubble. I like the use of the word irritating there, by the way. Uh, the, the investment banking profession will be S, fill in the blank, as long as S can be sold. So... Right. They're going to sell crap as long as people are going to buy crap. I got to be right? honest. I don't disagree with him. It, it, it seems like to, wrong. to me, if you're, if you're investing in a company and it's terrible that I even have to put that in air quotes because it's, it's not, it's almost not a company. It's just a guy with some money and you don't even know what necessarily what company they're trying to take public. I mean, it's, it's, it's glorified gambling. Is it not? You're basic. You're at the venture capital stage, really. But it's it's not even that. You're yes. You're you're investing. You're it'd be like you are an accredited investor, and you're you're investing with the venture capitalists that you has had a lot of success in the past, and you're trusting them to be able to find good companies to bring public. So, but that's very different than as a stock investor. Most people are used to right? Most people are used to having a company and being able to dig into their 10Ks and their 10Qs and understand the business and go to the websites and understand all this stuff. So it's a, it's, it is a different animal. Um, Munger's not, you know, he's cantankerous. He's 97. Uh, he's been there. He's done that. And he has zero Fs left to give. He was, just, he was brutal, brutal in his analysis of it. I, you know, I think there will be winners. Um, but there are going to be a lot of losers. And I think that that, you know, maybe that should have been the message. I think that, you know, he, his comment about it's making Wall Street rich because they're selling these things all day long, you know, I think that's getting ignored by a lot of people because people are focusing on how it's democratizing their ability to, you know, participate, right? So they're ignoring that component of it, but make no mistake, you know, institutional investors, accredited investors are getting in on these pipes, right? These pipe deals. And that's really kind of what came to light for the CCIV for a lot of investors bringing Lucid public. You know, I think the valuation that investor, retail investors were valuing that SPAC at like 60 billion or 70 billion or something like that. And then, you know, the pipe, which gets added to whatever money got raised by the SPAC uh, when it IPO'd and got put in trust, the pipe, gets added to that to give to the company to essentially make up for its value with the SPAC holding, I gets like 20% equity. When you add it all together, that should give you some idea of what this company is worth. So the retail investors had bid it up shares to like a 60 billion or 70 billion market cap. When the pipe got announced, the deal valued it at, the institutions were only valuing it at like 15 billion. So people were looking at it going, wait a minute, you mean the accredited investors, the institutional investors only think this business is worth about 15 billion right now. Why am I paying 60 billion in the open market for it? And you, as a result, you, that, I think that contributed to, to the sell-off that we saw in its shares. So I think that, and you know, make, these guys are making plenty of money getting in on these pipes. So you can say, well, they're, no, you know, they're, they're shutting off their access through the IPO window. Well, no, they're just, they're investing through the pipe instead. So, I mean, it's a, uh, I think it's, there's steps being made in the right direction. I wouldn't go as far as Charlie did in saying that they're all labeling the whole thing as shit. We better, whoop, excuse me, we better <laughs> off without it, right? Escaped me. Weep. I, th uh, I think we're allowed one. I'm, I okay, believe the FCC right. allows one. I think I will assume most of our listeners have heard that word before. Um, so I wouldn't go as far as, as leaving the whole thing as, as bad, uh, as crap, but I, I would say that 
I think investors do, this, there's a good wake up call to make sure that investors are doing their due diligence and understanding the sponsor and what they're getting out of it and understanding the pipe investor and what the pipe investor is getting out of it and then understand the company that they're merging with and whether or not you truly believe in that company. Yeah, well said. So while we're talking about speculative investing, uh, I just want to do a, a fairly brief follow-up on uh, our, our favorite game stonks, uh, which has been just a blast to watch this week. Only a blast to watch because I don't own any of it. Um, if I if I did own a significant portion of it, I would probably I, my heart would be palpitating at the moment. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what the heck happened? You know, on was it Wednesday with the big price jump in in the last hour of trading? If you could bring up a chart, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'll bring up the I'll bring up a ten day chart of it, Joe. Let me share my screen and I'll try to walk listeners through it. But if we are also on YouTube, if you want to tune into YouTube and see that. So Joe, can you see my screen okay? Sure can. So you can see right here on that, that close, it was Wednesday, I think, because we yep. were recording the class and all of a sudden the chat window, we're doing, we do the class on Zoom and the chat window started blowing up with people talking about GameStop's at 110, it's 150, it's 180, right? And I'm like, oh, settle down everybody, you know? But yeah, we went from like 50 to 180 uh, and then we've since retreated back down and then we opened up where I think we're up a little bit. Oh, we're flat today. We're flat today, but we were higher. But you're still, you know, doubled what you were uh, earlier in the week. Right. So, you know, you, you without a doubt. Um, I think that what we saw here today was a little bit of a play on what we saw again last month where people were, for lack of a better term, and I'm not saying this in a nefarious way potentially could be nefarious, but I'm, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But I do think that there might be some game, gamesmanship going on with GameStop in the options market. And I think that what people did is, you know, they went out again and they bought really far out of the money calls on GameStop right before the market close um, to basically force a tremendous amount of demand to come onto the market because the counterparty to that risk then has to go out and buy the stock to hold it in case it has to deliver it on Friday, which is today, you know, for options expiration. So, you, so I think that there was some gamesmanship with the upcoming option expiration to get in at the end of the day, push people up to so that they had to cover it. So they had to create this artificial, I'm going to call it artificial buying um, that was unnatural in a way. Uh, to the regular buy and sell matching throughout the course of the day. And because it was such a limited window of time, I think they did it relatively late in the day, um, you know, that caused the, the, a major spike, which of course ended up having some carryover um, afterwards. And I, I just, I worry, I worry a little bit about investors um, and, and this happening because, you know, it, it, you're assuming that you're going to be on the right side of that, speculative games gamesmanship and i don't want to say that investors are being played here right because some of them are are participating and and you know they're doing okay with it i'm not i'm not trying to diminish that i'm just but i am a little concerned that this could get used against you <laughs> you know at some <laughs> point you know buyer beware you don't know what the other party's you know thinking you yeah it's know, what their goal is or what their, you know, I mean, it's, the, someone's going to be left holding the bag on some of this stuff and it's not going to be Wall Street, you know, and you got to hope it's not you, you know, and I think that, so, you know, you and I had a debate a few weeks back. I mean, you really don't believe that GameStop will survive. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, I think that you were no, betting. That's, against, well, that's let me just, generally accurate. Yeah. yeah okay. But betting, maybe betting against the, the, the concept that it's going to thrive. How about that? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, may, maybe it survives, but maybe it won't thrive the way the stock price has been acting. Um, and I think there is an ar I think there's an argument that could be made both. So I think there's a bullish argument that can be made that they have insight that others don't have into into gamers that they could leverage and, and really end up um, reinventing their business. And hopefully Ryan Cohen 
uh, of Chewy fame uh, when they have their earnings release, GameStop will out, they'll, they'll provide a little bit more clarity into that pathway for that digital transformation that they want to make. But I just, I get worried because I feel like these, this stock is moving less on um, uh, actual business news and more on maybe some gamesmanship. So just go in with the eyes wide open, folks, if you're going to you know, trading this one, go in with the eyes wide open. Yeah, I mean, we we always say, you know, do do your research. Don't just don't just trade because somebody else is trading. And I think that's that's really applicable now. If if not, you know, before certainly now. Uh, so I guess we're we're running a little long on time. So I think we should go right into smattering because I know that. There, there's, there are a lot of companies now that are, that are on sale, at least might be a, a modest sale. We're not talking 20% off or anything, but I know, I know you made, you made a couple, a, at least a couple of moves this week uh, that are probably worth sharing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let me, let me share my screen um, and we'll pull up some charts. Uh, and take a look at a few stocks that I was buying this week that are high scoring in our research. And a free link, you know, free trial below. Free trial, we'll link. link. Yep, link it up. So, you know, you can get access to the research reports we do for large, mid, and small and see what the high scoring sectors are, weak scoring sectors, and the best stocks within them. I did go shopping. Like I said, I took my cash position from, you know, over 20% down to sub 10%. Um, I did establish some new stocks and I added to some stocks one of the stocks and joe you can see my screen okay yeah sure can digital turbine is a stock i've owned for a while I've got my cost oh, 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 oh. oh see my my dog is happy with that too i, so. I guess she likes it yeah, yeah. she likes she likes the stonk yeah she likes anyway while todd's muted <laughs> getting his getting his his barking dog out of the room uh, we've yeah, we so talked about digital turbine on the show before haven't we yeah, we have. And, and yeah. basically their play that they do app monetization for, you know, large carriers and app developers. So if you when you think about, you know, how many phones are going to transition to 5G phones, right? Um, you know, you can look at that and say, geez, you know, there's a potential opportunity for Digital Turbine to have some big, big tailwinds. So the stock has done very well. Uh, I did pair some off on this gap. Um, we've talked to them before. When you get three verticals, it's not a bad time. One, two, three up days to take a little bit off. I did pair it back. I don't know the exact cost, but it was above above 90 that I had paired it back. Um, I have since this week bought those shares back, and I bought them in a little bit below the 21-day moving average. And uh, listeners, you can go back and listen to a show we recorded uh, not too long ago where we talked about entry points on some stocks. I do like to buy them when they get to the 21 and the 50 day or even lower to the 200 day. So this was one of the stocks that I did allocate some more money back into. So Digital Turbine, again, high scoring in our research. Um, I also bought BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock's in, you know, probably best known for uh, ETFs and managing um, some fixed income portfolios, one of the largest asset managers in the world, as you can see from the, from the table on the bottom here, uh, revenue year over year up 13% in the fourth quarter, up 18% year over year in the quarter prior to that. Earnings going from $28, and $28 per share in 19 to 36 and 21 to 41 and 22. I love that kind of setup. I've been wanting to buy this stock for a while um, so I took advantage of the fact that it was no longer 788, as it was in the beginning of January, and was now trading in the 690s. Um, and I, so I bought some. And you can see that's below the 50 in the, in the 21 day, above the 200 day moving average, but it's also right along this channel. So I bought it at the low end of the channel. Again, high scoring in a good group. You know, finance has been a good group for us. It scores high in the sector ranking. So I took some of that. Um, I also, for the first time, Turk Mercury, why are you laughing? There are these guys who just conveniently are shoveling off the roof while we're recording. And so I have <laughs> to I have to remain muted while I'm not speaking so the so our listeners don't hear thud, thud, thud. <laughs> so that's why I'm laughing, everybody, if you can see my laughing face. 
Yeah, I'm like, okay, is it something I said? Yeah, no, I mean, this is the beauty of, of Zoom and podcasts, right? You never know when you get, you get dogs barking, you get people, sho- people shoveling roofs. It's, it's an authentic show, everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you don't even have to pay extra for that. We give that to you for free. So Mercado Libre um, is, you know, a, a, an e-commerce online play. Um, you know, I think it's headquartered in Argentina, but gets a lot of its business out of Brazil. Stock again that I've wanted to own for a long time time high scoring in our research 85 percent year over year revenue growth in the september quarter um, earnings 73 cents projected in 20, 2020 going up to a dollar 79 in 2021 and you know i'm buying it quote unquote on sale stock was a little over 2000 uh four or five weeks ago and my cost is right around 1610 something like that um so i felt like that was a pretty attractive entry for it. And then one last one, Joe. Um, this is a digital payments play, Adyen. Um, it's a foreign company. It's an ADR. Um, symbol there is A-D-Y-E-Y. Again, very high scoring. Every Monday, um, we crunch numbers for ADRs. That's part of the reports we send out on Fridays um, to our listeners and to our, to our subscribers. That's, um, the ADR best and worst report. And this one continuously scores well on it. 50% year over year growth in December quarter, uh, with earnings going up 41% from 21 to 22. And again, you know, this is a stock that was trading mid fifties, uh, a week and a half ago. And I was to be able to buy it for the mid forties, right on this 50 day moving average. So, I mean, you can kind of get a feel for it, Joe, just from, from those few that I shared, you know, if you look at, if you're looking through different reports or you've got your watch list, you've built it, you're sourcing information and ideas from different places and you're compiling that watch list, you can take a look because the market will give you these opportunities. You can just wait. And when you see them get down to the kind of these actionable points, you can go ahead and buy. I will just add one more thing, Joe, and this is just kind of something I do that others may find useful. I always set my entry target prices ahead of time. So it's not like I pulled up the screen and I said, oh, I'll buy this randomly here, right? I actually went through at the beginning of the week when the market started to roll over and I was looking at going, you know what? I think we could sell off pretty sharply. I went through the list of stocks I was most interested in. I set target entry prices. And when my target entry price was triggered, I said, okay, I'm buying it. Um, and it made it very non-emotional. And I think that that's very important in p- periods like this when you know, some people maybe really are, are taking it on the chin. If we can remove, remove emotion from our process so that it's very systematic, I think we're better off. Yeah, people tend to make mistakes when they, when they get emotional. I would just say in closing, buy the dip, everybody. It's a good, it's a good time to buy. Uh, yeah, personally, I think either today uh, before closing or on Monday. I'm going to be doing a little bit of shopping myself. So stay tuned. We'll be sure to talk about that on the show next week. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend.